Okay, Josh, we're live. All right, great. Thank you, David. Sounds like everything is good to go whenever you're ready to start. Uh, good evening. I'll go ahead and call the uh, October meeting of the Alexander Transit Company Board of Directors to order. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us tonight. First uh, order of business is to read the uh, electronic meeting notes. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic emergency, this meeting of the Alexandria Transit Company Board of Directors is being held electronically pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3708.2A3, the continuity of government ordinance adopted by the Alexandria City Council on June 20, 2020 or Section 4-0.01G in HB 29 and HB 30, as enacted by the 2020 Virginia General Assembly, Virginia Acts of Assembly Chapters 1283, and 1289 to undertake essential business. All members of the board and staff are participating from remote locations through a Zoom meeting. This meeting continues to be held electronically unless a determination is made that it is safe enough to be held in person at the Alexandria Transit Company Boardroom, 3000 Business Center Drive, Alexandria, Virginia. Electronic access will be provided in either event. The meeting can be accessed live via Zoom and Facebook. Recordings are posted on YouTube and the DASH website. Public comment will be accepted via Zoom. A Zoom registration link is available on the DASH website. Alternatively, requests for public comment can be made during the public comment period by utilizing the raise hand feature. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Um, and I, Beth was helping me get situated here, so I, I don't know if she's back at her desk yet, um, but if she is, we can go ahead and call the roll of the members. I am, thank you. Uh, Chair Kaplan? Here. Vice Chair Cleast? Present. Linda Bailey? Here. Larry Chambers? Here. Randy Collins? Here. Ian Greaves? Here. Matt Harris? Here. Jim Capsis? Here. Hilary Orr? Here. Ajaysha Thomas? Present. Okay, we have a quorum. Uh, everyone's present. Thank you, Madam Secretary. We will, um, well, first, uh, before we move into public comment, let me just announce that we are, um, uh, there's a CIP work session tonight uh, with council. So I know uh, Hillary has indicated that she will be attending that and Josh plans to listen to that as well. So we're going to try to break, uh, we're going to try to try to break around seven to, to accommodate them because this is important information that affects DASH and transportation programs in the city. Um, we'll go ahead and move into, uh, into public comment now. Um, I'll ask staff whether anybody had signed up in advance to speak. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. We do have one person that signed up to provide public comment this evening. Uh, his name is Sheldon Campbell. Um, I do know we received a message on Facebook that he was attempting to join. Um, so I'm checking to see if he has actually been able to join us. It doesn't look like he has. Okay. Uh, Whitney, I, I do have, it looks like some information that was submitted in advance by Sheldon. So yes, uh, Mr. Chair, if, if you'd like, I'll just read the written comments that were provided. And then if Sheldon does pop on while I do that, does that work for you? Yes, that's fine. Uh, it looks like this is uh, submitted in relation to a bus stop bus stop at Duke Street and Dove Street on the line number 30, formerly the AT8, has been moved closer to the eastbound off-ramp for Telegraph Road. The bus now has to cut across traffic to pick up passengers, and often the bus is in the lane closest to the median and preparing to make a left turn on the Callahan and simply skips the stop. Please ask operators to be prepared to pick up passengers at this stop. Alternative number one would be to move the stop to the southeast corner of the intersection. There is plenty of time for the bus to move over to the leftmost lane to make the turn onto Callahan. Alternative number two, the eastbound 30 could enter the King Street Metro Station from Diagonal Road rather than from King Street. And we'll record this uh, feedback and make sure that our planning department receives it unless you'd like to provide further comment on it. You know, as long as there is uh, an effort to, to follow up uh, with Sheldon about those concerns and uh, specifically, uh, you know, if drivers are unable to 
I believe that's a stop that's not served during peak rush hour, but it is served during um, off peak and uh, other other you know, weekends and to make sure that uh, we are addressing that because that, that is that is a serious um, concern if, if drivers just are unable to safely get over to pick up passengers where they're supposed to be. But um, yeah, I, I trust that we can follow up with 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 uh, Sheldon. And um, let me ask um, if there are other attendees who want to um, be heard who didn't register in advance. And I believe staff, they can do that by just uh, clicking the raise hand feature. That's correct. And I'm currently seeing the attendee list. I don't see any hands raised at the moment. Okay, we'll give them just a, a few more seconds. Any raised hands? Nope. Okay, go ahead and close public comment. Next action will be the adoption of the minutes from our September 8th meeting. They were included in our board packet. Are there any uh, revisions or changes to the minutes as presented? If not, I'll ask if there's a motion to adopt them. Chair, I move to adopt the minutes from our September meeting. All right, moved by Matt. <clears throat> Second. Thank you. Second. All right, I think got in first. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Minutes are adopted. All right. The uh, chair's report. I have a, a few items to share um, tonight. I sent an email to um, all, of, all of you last night, so you're aware of this and staff is aware of this, that um, we will remain in a virtual format through uh, the end of the current emergency that uh, the city has declared into January. So you can expect that our next few board meetings will be virtual. We will reevaluate this as um, we get more guidance from the city and certainly as, as local conditions change and um, you know, we'll then determine how we will enter back into in-person meetings or um, hybrid meetings or whatever the format will be. We've already passed the electronic meeting policy. So uh, we're well on our way to putting in place uh, when we do start to reconvene what, what is already available to us. Um, the next item uh, I have is we had an executive session at the end of the September meeting uh, that included an action that we took during the session, um, the city regarding the compensation of the general manager. The city has advised us that consistent with how employees who report to city council are handled, that a motion in a public session is needed to approve the compensation changes that were made in order for them to be processed. Um, so I believe um, our vice chair has a motion that he wishes to offer. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Kaplan. Uh, this is Stephen Kleist, and I move that the board approve the performance rating and compensation changes for the general manager that were agreed to upon the uh, during the executive session held on September 8, 2021. Thank you, Steve. Is there a second? A second. Okay, Jim. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, passes, thank you. Um, we had an event um, on, I believe it was September 23rd or 22nd to uh, welcome in the new Dash network that was held at the Van Dorn Street station. Um, it was uh, meant to be a media event and I think there was some media coverage of the event, but it really was a re very nice celebration of the work that staff had done and to hear from some of our partners, including NVTC, and the DRPT, um, as well as our mayor, our mayor spoke, and there was a um, recognition item that was, uh, which was a surprise that was presented to, to Martin Barna, who, who really has led this project for so many years. So I was, I was delighted to, to take part in that. And, um, you know, it was, it was a low key event, but I think it was really appropriate for us to take some time and, and celebrate also to gather with some people I, I frankly hadn't seen uh, in person in a very long time. So uh, I was, um, really happy to be, be part of that. And I thank everybody who worked to put that event together. And the last item that I have, um, th this uh, ties into the letter about the budget priorities that we're going to discuss uh, a little later. Um, last month, I had expressed that I, I wanted to see in the letter some um, recognition of the bus stops that remain, that have some accessibility challenges to them. And a lot of those stops are in um, Old Town and, and North Old Town and South Old Town. Um, where, where on-street parking is a challenge and they kind of remain blocked and inaccessible for a bus when there's a car parked in front of the stop for the bus to be able to 
pull over and, and pick up a passenger from the curb in a, in a wheelchair or has other mobility challenges. And uh, so I, I had suggested some draft language that we, the city basically study the remaining bus stops uh, that are there that are inaccessible. So that way, A, we have an inventory, we know the number, and we have um, then from there can develop a strategy and also to a recognition by the manager and council that this is a, a challenge to, um, you know, it's an equity issue in terms of getting everybody able to use our transit safely. Hillary advised me that the city already has an inventory of the existing bus stops and is uh, aware as part of that inventory of accessibility challenges, particularly with parking. And uh, so she suggested another avenue for us to, to kind of look at that and also to talk about bus stop amenities and access in general, because the city has a program that deals with transit stop improvements and amenities. And there are some new things that are going on with that, particularly with the uh, study of a um, bus shelter that um, I believe is, is a little more compact so that it can fit in some stops where there are right of way issues where we can't have bus shelters now. And that's certainly going to enhance the personal comfort of people who are waiting for, for stops in inclement weather. We're going to have a briefing on this program in November, and I, I appreciate Hillary um, coordinating that with, with her staff. And as part of that, I have asked that staff share with DASH the uh, information they have on bus stops that are inaccessible due to the parking concerns that um, are, are served by DASH. And, um, I'm going to ask the staff and TNES, and this is not going to be a, an immediate process, but to kind of look at those and start to figure out, are there stops that can be addressed? Um, and where are the priority stops where we as a board can make a request through traffic and parking to potentially have some parking removed and to improve some of the stops that are um, getting higher utilization where there are, are challenges in there. But along the way, there may be some creative ways that can solve this in terms of either slightly relocating stops or even potentially consolidating stops that are very close together um, to start to whittle that number down. Uh, and so I'm excited about A, this briefing and that there are improvements coming to our transit stops and B, that um, we as a board can begin to tackle what I consider to be one of the um, you know, biggest barriers to, to um, you know, ensuring that everybody is able to use our transit system and is one that I think really need some attention from a, a citizen group to really help to, to drive some of this because anytime you kind of get into talking about parking access that um, makes a lot of people in the city you know nervous and understandably um, but you know we need to find the right balance to ensure that you know we're get, able to, to get everybody on our transit system um, who wants to use it so um, uh, Hillary I'll, I'll ask if you want have anything you want to add to that um, um, no I think you covered it we're looking forward to doing a presentation and having a discussion with you all about this. Great, and it would be, um, as I said, I know that by November, we won't have an answer on the bus stops. So it would be helpful to kind of have that number and at least have a DASH staff have an opportunity to react to kind of where those stops are before then. So that way we can get an idea of kind of a timeline on this on this project and that, you know, there's, there's been some discussion uh, between the two groups. As I know you guys collaborate all the time, but to make sure we can kind of, you know, have a uh, have a timeline and have some clarity on, on how big a lift this is going to be. Um, thank you. Uh, that's all I have for my chair's report. Um, Hillary is next for the TNS report. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I will start out with just a quick update on the Alexandria Mobility Plan. So you heard about our plan last month and. During September, um, the plan was presented to you all, as well as the Commission on Aging, the Transportation Commission, um, and then the Planning Commission at the beginning of this month. And the, uh, the plan will be going to council for adoption this Saturday, and then again for some ordinance um, approvals on, on November 13th. But this Saturday is, is the main public hearing on, on that document. Um, so since then, there was a slight bit of language that was changed um, based on feedback from the tra uh, Transportation Commission, um, introducing language to um, encourage transitway connections into Fairfax County. So I can't recall how much uh, Jen discussed this at the, the last meeting with you all, but there is currently um, a council voted and I believe 2012 um, not to uh, have BRT running or buses running on Route 1 in Old Town. So that kind of basically eliminated the option of uh, connecting into Fairfax County Route 1 BRT. So 
um, the the discussion has been do we reconsider that now that Fairfax County is uh, further along with their their project so um, that was a change that was introduced um, okay second uh, the MBTA 70% funds um, in, on October 1st the city submitted two applications for the fiscal year 26-27 program. Um, the two projects that we submitted were one is basically a continuation of the Western Transit Way. So that project has been phased and phase one design and construction has been funded through MBTA and smart scale applications. This project is for the design of South Van Dorn Street. So basically, um, between Metro Road and McConnell Avenue, and there's two bridges that go over the railroad track and back with run there. And so um, design is going to be very complicated, very expensive. Um, we'll need a lot of structural, civil um, design. And so we did not have funding for this and thought it was an important next step to uh, expand upon the phase one um, plan with the Western Transit Way, providing some dedicated lanes along, uh, along Van Doren Street, which Additionally, you know, it's helpful as Fairfax County is talking about expanding transit and development to the south. This would um, provide a nice access for, for them as well. Um, if they if we ever did extend BRT into, into Fairfax County. Um, the other uh, piece of this is the current pedestrian and bicycle facilities across that, that bridge are uh, it's a narrow sidewalk with no bicycle facilities. So making it more multimodal is uh, one of the goals of the, this project. Uh, the other application that we submitted was for construction of a uh, pedestrian and bicycle bridge over Holmes Run Trail at North Morgan Street. There's currently a fair weather crossing there just, um, just north of, of Morgan Street, which is very frequently underwater. Uh, so this was for construction. The city would look to uh, fund design of this um, in FY23 or 24, so that by the time we got this money, we'd be ready to, ready to go. Um, so uh those those are the two projects that uh that we submitted this year and then lastly um the board had asked uh for an update on the city's paratransit program and i was initially planning on coming in october but we are currently working to award a new contract for service and also data management for this program. So we're gonna push that and, and we can talk about that in November, December once we've awarded a contract. But really the, the RFP for this program was crafted efficient routing services and also increase the availability of data. Um, the data we get now, it's, it's pretty limited um, and we are looking to get better data and then also provide um, make it easier for, for clients of this program to make reservations for rides, whether that's via an app, online, still maintaining the, the call center. We know a lot of people want to continue to use that, um, but right now people have to make reservations 24 hours in advance. Um, so we're just looking to streamline that program and, and make it easier. Um, and you know, we think that we'll have more clients as the, the population ages and, and just trying to be proactive and create some efficiencies with that firm. So, when we get that contract awarded and um, I will come back and I can do a, a presentation and we can talk in, in more detail uh, with the board about, about our paratransit program and, and how, we're, how we're using that in the city and kind of updating, updating the program. I think that was it. Any, I'm happy to answer any questions if y'all have any. Okay. questions for Hillary? Okay, if not, then we um, will move in to ask if there are other board members who have announcements for um, reports that they would like to share. Okay, if not, we'll move ahead into Josh's report. Um, I'm getting, uh, just, just so colleagues know, I may um, fall off this meeting briefly because um, it appears the battery I have is not recharging. I need to figure out if it's plugged in properly and I have very low battery life. So um, if I fall off the meeting, then I'll just ask Steve to run it while I work on that, but thankfully I'm here at DASH. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good evening, members of the board, Josh Baker, general manager. It's good to see you all again. 
Uh, last time I saw you, I was uh, a little bit under the weather, so to say, uh, but I'm proud, pleased to say that uh, fully recovered and uh, again, to advocate for everyone who's watching to be vaccinated because it made a big difference for me uh, in, in contracting uh, COVID-19. So uh, my report starts out discussing that very subject. Um, as you know, we have initiated, we've implemented a vaccination mandate at DASH. Uh, this mandate applies to all employees. It requires uh, that uh, all employees either be fully vaccinated or uh, submit a form indicating that they are electing to uh, receive a testing requirement weekly, which means that uh, if you are not vaccinated, you are required on your own to go get a test, uh, to submit your test results in a timely manner, uh, no later than Wednesday uh, each week, so that then you can be assessed uh, for duty and um, ensured that you are uh, free of um, uh, COVID. At this time, as you can see on the um, uh, screen here, we have been very successful in su substantially increasing the vaccination rate within the workforce. In fact, uh, as of today and looking down here at my other notes, we are at 85% of the total workforce of DASH is now fully vaccinated. Um, and that's 220 out of 260 employees. The uh, employees who are not yet vaccinated, we're continuing to work with some of them are in the process of getting vaccinated. Uh, however, they still have to submit to the testing requirement while doing that. Some of them are um, not getting vaccinated at this time for various reasons, uh, but are submitting to the testing requirement. I appreciate your patience and understanding in my communication previously to you about the cautionary word regarding impacts on service. And I just want to let you all know that um, through the hard work and dedication of the team and reaching out to individuals who had not submitted test results, uh, we were able to avoid any impacts, adverse impacts on our ability to provide service. With that said, this uh, requirement remains in place uh, indefinitely and uh, all new employees are required to be fully vaccinated. So anyone who's hired on must be vaccinated as a condition of employment. So we're really only dealing with those who are essentially grandfathered in on this particular issue. Uh, we're hopeful that the remainder will get fully vaccinated, but until they do, they will continue to submit to the testing requirement. We are honestly short on staff. Uh, everyone is. Uh, the labor environment right now is very, very tight. It's very difficult. So uh, making daily uh, pullout or the line requirements for the service is tricky to begin with. So any excessive number of people out at any given time has the potential to affect our services. Uh, but again, as I report to you now and report on the previous weeks, uh, we have not had any adverse impact on services. And that has largely been in part to due to the efforts of the operations team uh, and managing absenteeism, managing expected absences as compared to unexpected absences and in helping to ensure that we enforce this policy. Uh, we're very serious about it. I'm very serious about it. And I know that the board joins me uh, as well in, in uh, the desire to ensure the safety of our staff and our, our, our riders. Uh, so we'll continue to enforce this and uh, any individuals who are required to test and have met, not met the testing requirements as of uh, Wednesday uh, may be pulled from service unless testing results are received uh, prior to their reporting to work uh, and prohibited from working until uh, they do submit a negative test uh, or proof of completed vaccination. So that's kind of where we are with everything. Um, but again, you know, rarely do you get a memo from me like that midweek saying there's a potential risk for, for service disruptions, but I just want to commit to you that uh, that's, that's just an important part to me in making sure that you're aware of potentials uh, whenever we see those potentially coming down the pipe. But again, I'm really proud of the team for uh, avoiding those. So I'll just pause for any questions on the vaccine, vaccine front before I move on. 
All right, seeing none, this is a brief uh, update that was uh, submitted. I'm gonna run through this here, but I will acknowledge that we do have Joseph Kwanzaa, who is our office manager here to help answer any questions. But this is a, a brief update uh, telling you a little bit about how things have been going since we rolled out the new Dash network in regards to our call volume and our customer feedback. Um, overall, uh, Joseph has worked very hard with his team to report this information and to analyze it and to try to predict what kind of uh, customer inquiries we might receive. As you can see, uh, we have fallen well below almost half of what we anticipated as far as customer inquiries related to uh, the new network. And uh, we have maintained a, a strong uh, low complaint uh, record. Most of the complaints coming in are, are related to the new network or maybe confusion or maybe confusion uh, by the driver. As you can see, new service or missed stop is the highest complaints category. Joseph has reported to our senior management team quite often that the typical uh, issue that we see is driver related. Um, and that's, that trend has changed, which is a good thing. In fact, uh, through the efforts of incentivizing accommodations and incentivizing positive performance, we have actually received uh, four accommodations in the month of September. Usually we don't see, but one or two maybe at most. So it's really nice to see that our customers are letting us know that they're pleased with what we're trying to do. And the fact that uh, they've been able to obtain the information that they need about the new network through all of the resources we provided from the website to social media um, to, uh, to contacting us. So this is all a good, good sign for us. We're gonna keep, continue to keep an eye on it and make sure that um, we fill you in on any trends related to that. Again, I'll pause uh, for just a moment to see if there are any questions. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you, Joseph, for being available. And uh, thank you for your hard work with uh, your team. All right. Um, so the next item is uh, funding priorities. Uh, uh, our chair, Mr. Kaplan, mentioned this previously in his report. And I've got a summary here. Uh, and I'll point you to the board packet, which was distributed, that actually has the draft language of the exact letter that we put together upon the request uh, of, of the chair and, and the board, uh, outlining the priorities for operating and, and CIP funding or capital improvement project funding uh, for DASH. So as you see here on the screen, I've summarized those as, uh, as outlined. Essentially, we're recommending that the board prioritize maintenance of current service level, recognizing that there are substantial cost increases to continue to do business at the levels that we currently do. And obviously we'll be talking about that next with my operating uh, budget. Um, so we believe that the, the, should be the top priority followed by uh, the maintenance of the fare free structure, which has been positively received by our community and regionally and nationally has garnered a lot of positive attention. And third, to expand to the next phases of the ATV, um, increasing investment in portions of the ATV which remain unfunded uh, these include service enhancements for the Duke Street corridor, which is line 30, and supplemental increases for evening and weekend service levels throughout the city. So this is all really following uh, the ATV as outlined, um, but is, is represented in the letter as the, as the third priority after the first two have been met. And then following that is on the capital side to maintain state of good repair. This is a, uh, a priority that we have had uh, as staff and as a board for many years and has continued to ensure high quality of DASH services. So we'll continue to uh, propose that the board prioritize that as the top priority, followed by maintaining and continuing our goals towards zero emissions with electrification of the entire DASH fleet uh, with our commitment date of 2035 remaining in place. And then third, uh, to consider the fact that we are now approaching a timeframe under which the city and staff will need to be aware that the DASH facility is uh, approximately midlife. Um, and this is just a representation of the fact that we want to make sure that everyone is aware uh, within the city that this should be something as a preventative maintenance perspective that we ensure the uh, safety and uh, quality condition of the facility. 
Um, and then last, I'll, after I read this, I'll, I'll pause for questions, but, uh, and then Mr. Chair, I'll hand it back over to you. This slide here represents basically what you outlined in your comments and remarks previously. There is a paragraph at the end of the proposed memorandum that uh, reflects uh, those comments, which I won't uh, repeat at this time since I think you did a great job of outlining those. But I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair, uh, to discuss further and uh, with the board and consider any approvals here. Um, and, and your team did a very good job putting this letter together. I made one very slight change to the letter I asked Beth to do when I, I got here tonight, which just was to create a header for the bus stop accessibility issues. Although it is um, falls under the operating issues, we are highlighting it separately, and I just wanted it to kind of read um, well in the in the letter. So um, that's a very minor um, change. I'll ask uh, if, if board members have questions about any of the priorities or suggestions or anything that was left off or anything that we, we need to, um, to clarify in the submission. I'm not hearing any, um, so we would take a vote in order to send this. This is a letter that's going to the city manager um, to guide him through through his work on the budget. And I do appreciate the um, conversations that we got to have with with uh, with Hillary. And I know TNS is is a big champion of of Dash and what we're doing, and they um, often, along with our own staff, are are advocating for for these things. And um, you know, Hillary was was involved and in, in, reviewed this list in advance and was very supportive of what we're of what we're putting forward in line with what staff is suggesting. All right, well, I'll call for a motion then um, to to approve the letter. So moved. Larry. Is there a second? Second. Jim. Any further discussion? Not all in favor say aye. 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 Are there any opposed, any abstentions? All right, carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the next item for discussion here is the very first step in uh, our annual budgeting process. It always feels so early uh, since considering the new fiscal year has already just started in, in July, but um, as a part of the ongoing process informing the city's budget process, the dashboard uh, is being asked this evening to consider the uh, general manager's current services operating budget. Um, I'll just uh, take this opportunity to clarify that this is the budget representative uh, of what is needed in order to sustain services as we do today uh, and to sustain our fare free program as we have today. This is not to consider any ATV improvements uh, as called for or other investments. That will be the next phase um, where the city manager asks for supplemental and reduction uh, submittals. Once uh, the board considers the action this evening, following my briefing, um, the, the budget will be submitted within the city's process so that it can start uh, with everything else. Uh, then there is a whole lot of other activity that happens behind the scenes uh, and staff will be fully engaged with city staff as we work through the process. Um, I'll let you all know at this point as well that although he's not here this evening, uh, we are still in the active recruitment process for our director of finance and administration. Um, we have continued to talk with people and, and uh, work through this challenging environment to find someone. Uh, but with that said, uh, Evan Davis, who, as you all know, joined the city uh, recently and uh, in a new role, uh, continues to be available to us. And he and I have had conversation in particular in helping us to continue to navigate the budget process since it is something that he started. And uh, so I'm very thankful for him. He's not on here this evening, but I have asked him to uh, be available for the future board meetings as we continue these discussions. Um, his new supervisor has been very gracious with his time and helping us out somewhat during the day, but I have further engaged Evan to let him know that we would compensate him appropriately for additional time served with Dash as he helps us work through this process. So um, I'm just very thankful for him and I think it will make the process and transition much smoother, especially considering uh, how complicated the budget process can be. So with all of that said, um, the uh, proposed operating budget 
as outlined in the board packet, uh, represents a uh, an, an overall increase of approximately 13.5%. In future slides, I'll explain what that is composed of. Again, this is not representative of revenue. This is simply the, uh, the cost of operating. Um, it does account for ultimately for rev, uh, changes in our revenue sources and adjusts for uh, most significantly the fact that we are in our final year of our collecting bar collective bargaining agreement, which has the largest step increase of the duration of the contract. So um, it's sort of a, a backloaded contract in the sense of compensation. So a lot of factors uh, there that are contributing to the substantial increase. Um, we do anticipate continuing to be a fully fare free system. Uh, so we are not accounting for fare box revenue. Uh, miscellaneous revenue associated with contracts and charters is likely uh, to, to begin to sunset during this fiscal year. This is lar in large part due to uh, the, the desire to pursue federal funding. When you receive federal funding, providing contracted charter services is not permissible. Um, and that is intended to avoid the conflict of federal dollars competing with private industries who are attempting to operate charter services. Um, so this is just sort of an introduction. I've uh, broken out here a little bit to give you a, give you a sense. Uh, the largest chunks of this cost are broken down by the compensation adjustments called for with our collective bargaining agreement. The fact that we now operate under the new network is a 24 seven operation. So both in operations and in maintenance, we now have staff uh, in the building 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's necessary to support the uh, duration of service that goes along with the new network. Um, and then the largest uh, piece outside of the personnel costs is maintenance and fuel. And candidly, uh, you all have seen at the pump what's happening. Uh, we expect that trend to continue. This may be a, a somewhat of a low number, but Fuel is always one of those things that will vary year over year and have a, um, have, will have challenge predicting. Um, the rest of this is, is just regular maintenance of the technology. Uh, and one line item there represents uh, the environment under which we are now operating with the struggles of recruitment and right sizes the budget according to what it is costing us to not only seek, recruit, and onboard staff to sustain our services. Um, on the revenue side of things, you'll see I've color coded these. We are uh, looking for a bump in our advertising program revenues. It's still too early in that program to have true returns as to what kind of advertising revenue we're seeing. Uh, we did build in a minimum annual uh, revenue requirement with the contractor. So we do know what that is, um, but we continue to be conservative in our estimates as to where that will go. Certainly COVID, has had an impact on how much people are advertising, uh, largely because of the slowdown economically um, and, and the changes in how people are going about doing business. Uh, the biggest hits here on the revenue side, you'll see uh, highlighted in red. Uh, the fare free operation, uh, that number here looks pretty low, but understand that this is relative to the fiscal year under which we weren't collecting fares because of COVID. Uh, generally, our budget would typically have around $4 million worth of fare box revenues in it, um, which have basically sunsetted during the pandemic and basically uh, no longer show up on our budget. So that amount of, of, of revenue loss is reflective of the early revenue we collected prior to the pandemic and what we will collect none of now since we're fare free. Um, the other big item here is an ongoing challenge for us, and that's related to the line 102X. This is the express line that is operated under contract with DOD. It has been a service we've operated for many years, and it provides express service for DOD employees. It is open to the public, um, but it is largely intended to move people between the King Street Metro and the Mark Center. Unfortunately, for our reasons unknown to us, but we would suspect have to do with the changes in how people are working and where they're working, the DOD has, has elected their option not to renew this contract. Um, we anticipated they were going to renew it and had every indication previously that they would. However, they have changed that tune. 
Uh, I want to let you know that we still have meetings scheduled with them, and we are still hopeful to save a portion of that. We do believe that there may have been some confusion as to exactly what they were paying for. They were not paying for fares. They were paying for actual service. So that service will go away um, in the event of the loss of that contract. Um, that contract was making uh, um, enough to cover the service and then some. And so not only do we lose or are able to cost cut uh, the, the, the service, but we also lose the additional revenue above and beyond that that was associated with it. Um, we are anticipating uh, pursuing federal funds in the coming year. It's hard to know what the timing of that may be. So this number may change during the budgeting process and that's probably an easy one to change, but there is a ref reflection of what would happen if we discontinue charters. And then last, but certainly not least, uh, the expiration of the CARES and CRISA funds that were associated with the uh, uh, recovery acts for the pandemic um, that, that basically made up for a lot of the fare box revenue is no longer going to exist. Um, now, a couple of things to consider here when, when we think about this is there are some things that are not accounted for. One of which is we have applied for and are waiting for information regarding our trip funding. And forgive me for jumping around a little bit here, but I feel like I wanna explain this in this way. Um, you can see in this slide on the right-hand side here, the amounts that were applied for through the transit ridership incentive program. That, those funds go directly to offset the city subsidy of DASH because we're fare free. Um, those awards, as you can see, um, reduce year over year. However, it looks a little strange because year two actually goes up. That has to do with how they allowed us to calculate the maximum eligible uh, um, uh, support that they could give us through the program. So these are the maximum numbers that we can go after, and that's all based on the fares we had been collecting previously, uh, as well as the ridership numbers. So in all, there's approximately $7.2 million uh, over the course of those four years. Note that in year four, uh, we must remain fare free, and that is a condition of the receipt of these funds. So this is one area of revenue that is not reflected in the budget at this moment under current services, but would go in upon, um, upon a submission. And then the other item, and then uh, Matt, I'll get right to you, is the, um, is the ARPA fund or American Rescue Plan uh, uh, money. And there's approximately $8 million that is dedicated towards transit uh, that is coming to the city of Alexandria. It is Alexandria's uh, determination as to how that money is used. And it is just like the CARES and CRISA Act, it is issued to the city in the form of a WMATA subsidy credit. Um, so it could be used to offset year over year increases for WMATA, or it could be used to address these increases for DASH. It's really up to the city budget uh, process to determine that outside of, uh, of what we're doing. Um, so I'm going to leave this table up on the screen while I answer questions, which sort of shows you a comparison uh, of the budget. And I'll answer uh, your question. Now. Yeah, Josh, thank you. Um, two quick questions. In year four, if we don't remain fare free, do we have to refund the money that was previously given to us? Number one. Um, I don't know the direct answer to that, but I can tell you that as a part of the application process, which uh, we asked the asked city council to approve, that was one of the conditions. So okay. that was um, included. Yeah. And then the, the second thing is um, on the Fed funds, sometime back you said, at least pertaining to the 13C mm -hmm. FTA funds, that if you went and applied for those, you'd have to hire a full-time admin person. Is that also calculated in your budget? So good question. The, um, the, the goal is to um, have a potentially to have a person who manages the grants on the city side and on the dash side. That's not reflected in this budget because that's not a current service. 
that's not something that we're currently doing, but we would we would in incorporate that into the supplementals and identify it appropriately there. And the last thing I'll just point out, uh, just as a, a point of reference, to help everyone kind of understand um, where we are relative uh, to WMATA, um, and this is this is the easiest publicly available information. We could certainly do comparisons with other counties, but you can see that we're still almost $100 less per hour or per platform hour to operate. So arguably we're still a good deal um, in regards to the services we're providing for the city. And, and we've seen that. We've seen where we've talked about Dash doing services that WMATA otherwise might have within the city limits um, and the benefits of that. But you know, honestly, um, we're still working very hard to maintain a streamlined operation. We feel like this is an operation that is uh, both representative of the quality and expectations of our service um, and supports the team appropriately, but also is, is fiscally uh, conservative and, and representative of the fact that we understand that there is a lift here to fund these things. Um, and uh, so I would just say publicly that understanding the, the lift that is here, my commitment to the board, uh, as I will do with Evan or, and or his successor uh, throughout the budget process is to both support them, but also to support the city and the struggles that the city uh, uh, may have in regards to uh, right-sizing uh, their budget process as well. Um, but again, I'll, uh, this is probably impossible to see on the screen, but I'll just tell you that this is in the board packet. This is uh, uh, the detailed budget uh, by line item and the information that will be submitted. Um, and then lastly, uh, I will um, point out the budget process and kind of where we are. I don't know if you're able to see my cursor when I do this, but we are here in October. You can see that uh, in November, we're going to be looking at the uh, reduction. Uh, this actually will have taken care of uh, this operating budget um, and submittal to OMB is actually a month earlier this year, I think, than normally. Um, but we'll also be coming to you in November with the supplementals and reductions. We will we expect to receive the budget guidance from the city manager's office the middle of the month, which we're about there. Um, but we have been given a preliminary indication of what we should prepare for. And so my team and I will be reviewing that and working very quickly. Um, and as I mentioned, Evan will help us as well to, um, to put together the supplementals and, and, uh, and reductions in accordance with the requirements of the city's process. Then we have kind of a break for December, January, and February while the budget process goes on within the city. This is an interesting year too, because in January we're expected there will be a new city manager um, coming in the middle of the process. So hard to know how that's exactly gonna play out but then you'll see again the TDP and budget back in March. And that will be a reflection of uh, where the city is and where we are in relation to the budget as, as proposed. So we can then have that time to discuss further and make adjustments uh, as they are needed. So I will pause for any questions uh, and turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair, for consideration of action which uh, uh, approves the submittal of the current services budget uh, for the city's budget process. Um, see if there are other questions from board members. I think this was a, a very clear presentation. I mean, it is, especially with many new um, members of, of council coming in, um, regardless of the outcome of the election because of the, um, the, the turnover. I mean, it's a story that we're gonna have to be careful in, in telling and explaining um, some of the significant growth. Because um, I think that, you know, one of, one of the things in the TRIP program helps a great deal. Uh, we're going to get our application, but the, uh, you know, the fair free has been kind of sold as something, well, it's not a very heavy budget lift, but it really does become progressively more so. And as we're trying to hold on to the service that we have. And so I think we're going to really have to, I think you, you're thinking along the right, path of, of looking at ways that we can compare ourselves so that we can look at other transit services in the area. So at least there's some benchmarking, but I, I do think it's um, you know, gonna be very important for us to 
try to look for ways that we can really explain these these um, budget drivers to the the community um, because you know we um, we are going to be asking for for considerably more money. Yeah, thank you. And I uh, and I kind of skipped over this on this slide, but this is a you know on the left hand side is a projection of the of the uh, uh, foregone potential revenues that we would have been looking at. Um, without the pandemic and without the, having gone fair free and there's opportunity costs associated here as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll make sure we include this story as we're asked and as we discuss. And again, it's a, it's a, it's a work together process we're committed to and we've done years before and we'll do it again this year. All right. Well, I'll ask if there's a um, motion to um, submit the, um, the budget, the current services budget submittal. So moved. Moved by Matt. Second. Second by Steve. Any further discussion? Not all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, passes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the last item here on my uh, report is I'm pleased to welcome a uh, outstanding and enthusiastic team member from, from DASH. Uh, some of you may have met him previously and may have not. Uh, Gabriel Mori is our ITS coordinator in our planning department. He is one of the masterminds among several that have pulled off the new network. Uh, and Gabe really is heavily involved in the ITS side or the technology services side of what we do, um, specifically the on bus technology. When you look at a map to see a bus moving around and when it's going to get to your stop or you're standing there where there's a bus stop sign that's lit up and telling you when the bus is getting there, that came from Gabe. So I'm going to turn the floor over to him for a few minutes to talk about the excellent work that he's doing uh, and to field any of your questions. And Gabe, if you just say next slide as you go along, I'll, I'll make sure to, to move it along for you, okay? Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, before I begin, can you hear me? I sure can. Perfect. Um, so good evening. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Thank you so much for having me uh, speak tonight. Um, as Josh said, I'm, I'm Gabriel Mori. I'm the Intelligent Transportation Systems Coordinator at DASH. Um, before I begin, just to, to clarify, ITS that you'll hear me say tonight is not information technology. It is intelligent transportation systems, um, closely related, but slightly distinct. Um, so broadly, ITS is a suite of tools that uh, we use at DASH to allow our buses to communicate with people, devices, and other things outside of the bus across Alexandria. Um, for instance, allowing our dispatchers to be able to track buses. Um, and at DASH, our ITS team is comprised of just two people. It's uh, myself and uh, an ITS technician, Alexis A.J. Perla. He's in the photo there. And tonight, I'll just give a quick overview of what A.J. and I do and highlight four key projects that have just concluded um, within the last 18 months um, at DASH. So next slide. So our team is housed in the planning department. Uh, we report to Martin. Um, however, we're really interdisciplinary and we're all across the building with a broad range of duties that make us kind of everywhere. We have our hands in a lot of pies. Um, our largest responsibility is the Clever Devices system. Um, that is the Computer Aided Dispatch Automatic Vehicle Location or CAD ADL system. Um, which is comprised of a computer on every bus that communicates back to a network of computers here at DASH uh, and allows you and our dispatchers to track where buses are. It allows customers to be able to get predictions um, and also you know, gives other key statistics like on-time performance and ridership data to our planning team. Um, it also controls the onboard announcements and the destination sign changes on each bus. But outside of Clever, we're responsible for a whole other suite of tools, um, including actually creating the destination signs and maintaining the physical electronic hardware of them. Um, so I do all the destination sign design here in house. Um, we also maintain our transit signal prioritization, our automatic passenger counters, uh, pretty much anything that's customer facing and technology oriented, we have our hands in. And any given day, you can find us either elbow deep in Excel or ArcGIS doing data analysis, or um, just earlier today, I was literally elbow deep in a bus. Uh, trying to fix a uh, Clever Devices digital screen. So we really straddle the line between transit planning and, uh, and light maintenance. Uh, next slide. So the first of the four projects that I wanna go over is a new tracker. 
And this is something that launched actually back last year in uh, summer 2020, but has been an evolving project since then. And we knew for several years leading up to the launch that our legacy dash tracker was reaching its end of life. Um, and after doing an initial market analysis with uh, Todd Christensen, our uh, IT manager, um, we determined that One Bus Away, which is the, the same software that powers Wilmot's bus ETA, was a suitable replacement given our needs and our budget. Um, but we wanted to make sure that customers would feel the same way. Um, so I actually designed, led, and then analyzed data from two customer focus groups that we held in February 2020, right before COVID. Uh, I think it was the last in-person events we did. And the result of that work led us to make a couple key changes to the interface of Dash Tracker, including this map view that you see here. Um, we actually had the, uh, the software team that designs and deploys Tracker for us redesign that user interface based on feedback that we got. Um, overall, new Tracker has provided customers with a whole host of other benefits, including access to both Wamata and Dash information in the same website. Um, an actually mobily optimized tracking platform, whereas our old one was not particularly friendly to use on a mobile phone. And it may be best thing yet, it's open source. So we're able to make continuous improvements to it as the One Bus Away software gets improved by its community of transit users. Um, the last time we did this was actually about two months ago when we finalized something called the Kalman filter, which is an add-on algorithm to tracker that has improved prediction accuracy by 10 to 20%. Um, which is huge. I mean, that's just unheard of. We, we would go nuts for a 1% increase in accuracy and 20% is just outstanding. Um, at the same time we did that, the uh, company that deploys Tracker tested adding traffic congestion data from uh, TESS's uh, traffic sensor network, um, but unfortunately found that that did not provide better, better results for customers. Um, however, even just doing that test puts Dash in the top 1% of transit agencies in the country in terms of innovation and tracking of buses. I don't think there's any other agency that I know of that does that. And Cambridge Systematics who deployed Tracker for us and you know, does everything from New York MTA to uh, WMATA, they don't have a single customer who has deployed uh, traffic congestion data into their prediction engine. So we're really cutting edge here. Um, next slide. Um, hardware upkeep seems like kind of an odd project to, uh, to bring up here, but I did want to brag about it a little bit um, because hardware is the backbone of our systems. If the hardware is broken, nothing else will work downstream from it. And we have a very uh, stringent program to try to keep our hardware in good shape on the ITS team, including doing twice a year preventative maintenance on every bus, um, checking every wire, checking every connection and also creating SOPs and diagnostic guides to pass down to future ITS coordinators and technicians to be able to use to maintain this equipment. Um, and, and I really wanted to highlight it because we've gotten some notice from the transit community for it, um, particularly from a, an app called DC Metro Hero. Some of you might've heard of them. They produce a, a kind of third-party app that you can use on your phone, very similar to the transit app. And they actually called Dash out earlier this year we're having 99% uptime on our real time, which means that buses were reporting their locations 99% of the time that they're supposed to, which is unheard of. Um, and after that came out, Jordan Holt, who's the director of performance at WMATA reached out to me to ask if we could meet with them and explain how we had such high uptime. And you know, I told her that part of it is that we have amazing operators who log in to their runs every single day like they're you know, supposed to and really enjoy using the Clever system. But the other half is that we do this preventative maintenance and we have a culture of every time you're on a bus, check the wires, make sure the ethernet cable's plugged in, make sure the GPS is tight. And it's really helped us keep this really high quality of data. Next. Um, and the third project is disruption management. This builds on the Clever Devices system. It's a suite of tools from Clever that allow our dispatchers to minimize impact during disruptive events like road closures. Um, the tools include being able to draw detours in real time um, that then get pushed out to buses and eventually will get pushed out to customers too. Um, they give audible turn-by-turn -turn directions for our operators for both regular routes and detoured routes. And they now allow us to make courtesy stops that actually do stop announcements, although they're not in the pre-recorded voice, they're a uh, robot voice that we have to use to do those courtesy announcements. Um, this process takes about 30 minutes to do these things. 
the normal process for doing any of those changes I just mentioned would be anywhere from two to four weeks. So it's a huge difference in time savings to be able to, you know, uh, kind of react to things on the street. And this is powerful, but it's required us to train our dispatch staff to think like transit planners because they don't have four weeks to make those changes like we do. They have 30 minutes and customers are upset because service is disrupted. So I sat down with uh, Amaha uh, Lagasse, our assistant manager of um, operations, and Kevin Hernandez, our director of operations, to actually create SOPs for using disruption management. We spent about six months doing that and then trained all of our dispatch staff and other key operations personnel uh, between January and May of this year about 80 to 100 hours of training, I estimate, that I delivered, although I'm not sure the exact number. Um, this has gotten superb results for us. Dispatch has a high rate of use of it. Um, they've used it for very recent events like the King Street repaving um, and the Pentagon shooting, which is the true definition of a disruptive crisis. Um, and they just do it on their own. They push out the detours. Operators know what to do and service keeps moving, even if we're going somewhere different. Um, we've also gotten some uh, notoriety from Clever Devices for our creation of the SOPs and the buy-in that we've gotten from staff on it. And they've actually invited me to talk with GRTC in Richmond and share with them the process that we took here at DASH to get such good use out of disruption management. Um, in the future, we're gonna be incorporating it into Tracker um, because of uh, some funding Funding shortfalls we have with our tracker program, we couldn't just immediately roll out all of the integration with it. But within the next two months, we do uh, look to be releasing a new feature to tracker that will send an automatic alert out to bus routes that have uh, detours posted on them. Um, so that is a really good incremental improvement that will at least give people a heads up that a your route is detoured. Um, you know, make sure you know where you're going. Uh, next, and I need to wrap this up, so I will hurry through this. Um, so our last project here I want to highlight is our real-time signage. This one is very dear to me because it's the first thing that I worked on at DASH in 2018 when I joined. Um, back then, we had three LCD signs across the city and uh, one solar-powered sign. And today, I'm happy to report we have six locations with uh, LCD displays and over 50 um, solar-powered real-time signs at stops. Uh, these signs provide our customers with real-time data and relevant uh, transit alerts. And there are more coming. We do have plans to continue to expand it. Um, one of the most unique things that we do is uh, we actually partner with Metro to manage the Alexandria signs because they currently use the same solar powered vendor that we do. Um, I think we're the only agency I know of that shares a back end like this. And because we had the same system, I approached them back in 2019 and asked if we could get control over the Metro signs in Alexandria could DASH serve as the first responder for them? And they graciously said yes. And that means basically that DASH has about 20 signs that we manage that we don't pay anything for. That's worth about $54,000 of capital costs and saves about $18,000 to $20,000 of operating funding a year. Um, and these are Metro owned signs. I have some of them down in our storeroom right now. Um, and as long as DASH is the you know, agency that is putting them up and maintaining them and monitoring them, Metro is happy to let us use them. So to keep up the signs, we do monitor them daily online. And then we also do these uh, in-person field checks six times a year. Um, that's a new project that we've gotten to start since AJ was brought on board this past April. Uh, next slide. So there are a ton of other projects I wish I could share with you all. We are a very busy two-person team and often joke that we wish we could clone ourselves to get more done. Um, but some of the other things to just kind of keep, keep your head up for in the future are um, automatic passenger counter, calibration and validation. This is very important now that we're fare free and are losing that, that uh, you know, ridership data from our fare box. Um, growing our transit signal prioritization program to more buses and more intersections and working with uh, our counterparts it's city traffic to do that. Continuing to roll out new disruption management features and then also transitioning our Clever Devices system to the next generation operating platform that Clever has released. Um, but since I'm out of time for tonight, um, you can go to the next slide. And if anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, Gabe, it's, uh, it's David. Thank you very much for the presentation and uh, for all the work that's going on. And it's really interesting to learn about um, 
you know, all of the innovative things that are happening, the recognition that Dash is receiving, as well as some of the collaboration that's going on. It's actually saving us money too. Um, just, uh, and I had shared this feedback with Josh, and I wanted to share it with you as well on the transit signs. Um, I had noticed that some of them a um, few years ago were um, getting, were being destroyed maybe by some kind of vandalism that was occurring and they weren't very resistant. And so there was a lot of broken signs, particularly in the central part of our, of our city. And, you know, as a, as a rider or somebody passing by a transit stop, you know, you, you can tell a lot about how, you know, what's invested in the transit system based on how the stop is maintained and the availability of that information. So I understand that you've spent a lot of time with the vendor making sure that there's glass that's harder to break and that it, they're going to be more resilient. So I, I really compliment you for those. And I see that those, those um, signs are working again. And that's great to know as we go to expand to make sure we have a product that's going to hold up beyond the warranty. So, so well done there. And um, anybody else have questions? Well, and I'll say that I've said this to Josh, it's good to hear from others on the staff too about the very exciting work that they're, that they're doing. So thank you for, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, financial reports. Um, Josh, you're gonna, you're gonna present on that? Well, I, I don't really have much to present, uh, Mr. Chair, but thank you. Um, I just wanted to you know, let the board know, as I mentioned before, that uh, we are continuing to work on the process of getting our uh, director of finance in, uh, position filled and that Evan is gonna continue to support us throughout the budget process. Um, just, uh, this is something that Evan largely covered in the last meeting, just a very brief recap um, that we have a uh, ongoing uh, anticipated deficit largely gone to as a result, result of foregone fair revenue that comes along with the grant expansions uh, of the line 35 and line 36 AB. Those were funds that were reduced uh, from the, uh, the grant itself because of uh, not having the uh, uh, matching revenues. The reality here is that we anticipate all of this gap being uh, covered and then some through the TRIP program. Um, and if not, we will work with the city uh, closely to uh, coordinate the, the how to address uh, any residual shortfalls that are associated with, with the program. Um, but I will also say that um, as, a, as a Secretary of Virginia Transit Association, for which our mayor is president, uh, Mayor Wilson is president of the Virginia Transit Association this year. We attended a couple of weeks ago updates from the state and are seeing very favorable work from them and, and very, very, very strong interest in what we're doing and supporting what we're doing. So we anticipate that process uh, continues to move forward favorably. We'll keep you all posted, uh, but other than that, uh, we'll move on uh, to uh, Martin for a brief update. Uh, if you are so inclined, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Josh. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, Martin Barnum, Director of Planning and Marketing. I uh, am, am here this evening to provide a, a, another update for the new DASH network. When we last met uh, in early September, we had just rolled out the new network and free fares. Uh, so we did provide kind of an abbreviated um, report. Um, and I wanted to provide a little bit more detail uh, in this meeting. So that's what we're doing here. Um, I can say uh, on, on a high level that um, the network launch has been relatively uneventful, which I think is when, when a network, as far as network launches go, that's always a good thing. I think we've had um, uh, very few major issues um, that have come up. Uh, I think that's a credit to, to our team here, especially the operations and maintenance um, departments. Um, and I uh, also want to highlight the, the, the great job that our customer service team has done and our marketing team. Uh, Josh mentioned some of the numbers earlier uh, in terms of our, our complaints and uh, commendations. So uh, really great work on that front as well. Um, I do have a slide here in a minute that will show some ridership numbers, but overall, um, I just will, I'll highlight that the uh, ridership has increased um, significantly. Um, Josh, actually, if you could go back a couple of slides, I'm not quite there yet. I had a couple other points I wanted to hit. Um, yeah, there you go. So uh, the, the, the ridership has gone up, uh, especially in the West End on Line 35. Uh, that's become our busiest route by far. Um, the, that's the one that uh, replaced the AT1 Plus. That's Line 35 from Van Doren up to the Pentagon. So uh, big increases on that route. I'm also seeing uh, significant increases on uh, weekends. Um, we uh, do have a, a, a two week lag in our ridership reporting. That's due to some of the processes we have to go through to um, 
get the data from the fare boxes uh, through the probing process that they go through each night. Um, and then also due to some cleansing and validation processes that we have to go through. Um, and we're being extra cautious given the, the fact that we're transitioning from uh, collecting fare box data to, uh, well, it's still fare box data, but instead of being uh, from smart trip cards and, and tapping and all that, it's more of, it's from driver drivers pushing the button each time a person comes on the bus. So we're being extra cautious to validate the numbers, but I can tell you that they've gone up significantly. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, operations, as you can see here, has, has completely transformed overnight to become 24 seven with additional field supervisors and yard masters. Um, and as I've mentioned, we've had uh, very little confusion from drivers getting lost. That hasn't really happened at all. We are expecting quite a few, you know, um, you know, instances where, where drivers might get lost with the new routes, but that really hasn't materialized. So that's really a credit to our operations team and, and, and more so our training department. Um, so, so great work there. Um, and, you know, as Josh has mentioned, we're having uh, some, some serious staffing shortages. We're not where we intend to be on our, our staffing, but uh, operations has managed to, to avoid missing any trips um, and there's been no customer impact. So, so credit to them. Uh, next slide, please. On the same lines, maintenance is also transitioning to, or has transitioned to 24 seven coverage. Um, and they have uh, ensured that we have had a, had a fleet, uh, had no fleet, fleet shortages. Um, it's a little tighter than we would like, but they have, have done a great job of keeping things, um, you know, not missing pullout and, and uh, making sure that we have enough buses running. So uh, they're also working hard on the new electric buses, and that's taking up some of their time as well. Uh, those should be entering revenue service in the next couple of weeks here. And then marketing, uh, as, as I highlighted last month, uh, we had a, a major, uh, very comprehensive effort to, to get the word out about the new network, um, highlighted by a number of different, you know, aspects, uh, including the ambassadors. We had over 300 ambassador hours spent at key locations during the, the two weeks around the launch. And uh, we, we calculated the number of in-person interactions that we had with the ambassadors. And we had over 4,000 in-person interactions, uh, which worked out to over 300 per day. So we were really talking to a lot of people, which I think is um, a big part of why we've had such a smooth rollout. Um, and we'll continue to, to promote uh, the new network and free fares in the coming months. And then the last slide I wanted to share uh, was the ridership slide, um, which you can see uh, shows a couple of things. First, this is the weekly ridership for the last three months. Um, and again, this is the preliminary data, uh, but it does show a, a strong upward trend, especially for the last the last four bars on the right. The blue bars are the ones that were post network launch. So you can see the, the uptick in the weekly boardings. We were down around you know, 30,000 uh, boardings per week over the summer. Um, you know, this time last year, we were down closer to 20,000 boardings, and now we're up uh, well over 50,000 boardings uh, per week over the last couple of weeks. Um, and the orange line shows the percentages of um, comparison to pre-COVID uh, ridership. And you can see the, the axis on the right side shows the percentages. So over the summer, we were uh, around 50% of our pre-COVID ridership levels. And as of two weeks ago, we were up to about 66%. We just got last week number last week's numbers, and we are up close to seventy percent now. So we're seeing a really strong upward trend um, in the ridership. Uh, we expect to have the full September data uh, cleaned and validated in the next couple of days. Here, we don't have the exact number yet, but I can tell you the ballpark will be about a twenty percent increase over the August numbers. So really seeing some positive trends, and uh, we'll continue to, to report these and, and provide transparency on the on the numbers going forward. So. That's all I have. Happy to take any questions. Great news, Martin, on the ridership, and um, you know the team continues to adapt to the new the service circumstances, and we understand the challenges as as both you and Josh have articulated about the labor shortages. Um, I, I'll just I, I did take the right bus today, so I didn't <laughs> cause a, a delay. I know my thirty and thirty one now. Um, I did uh, want to just. Uh, make one observation, just mainly as a as a as a rider. Um, it does seem that that King Street Metro Station is is very crowded, and particularly with the number of buses that are servicing there. I have noticed um, a number of times delays where um, a bus maybe that is not carrying passengers may be parked. Maybe the driver's using the restroom where they're resting, and so the stop is blocked, and so the bus comes in. The bus comes in to serve that stop, and basically then parks in the road to let riders off or parks in an adjacent bay and then basically you have buses that sort of stack up behind them that then can't get around. Um, I realize that this is not just Dash, this is Dash and WMATA together, but it seems to be a bit of a choke point that I'm wondering if better um, supervision and coordination between the station in terms of where the buses stage and 
Park may may help with that. And just curious if, if there's been discussions or if that's being looked at potentially as, as maybe a, a contributor to some some delays. Yeah, yeah. If you were to rank the the issues that we're having with King Street in the first couple months, uh, the I think it's actually at the bay that you use uh, is is is, um, is is bay uh, it was bay B um, is is utilized by both Dash and Metro buses. The, the Dash Line Thirty and the Metro Twenty Nine K and N. And uh, we that's the, been the number one issue is that uh, we we have buses that lay over in that bay that are not supposed to be laying over, which. Um, Sounds innocuous, but it means that the, the, the bus that is supposed to be there uh, with passengers has to stop in the middle of the street. Passengers have to get off in the middle of the street or they have to board in the middle of the street, uh, which is really not safe. A lot of times you have passengers who have to sprint out uh, into the road to try and catch the bus or get the driver's attention. So um, our operations team is, is um, that's their, their top priority with King Street. They've been coordinating very closely with WMATA and their staff, their operations team, to uh, make sure drivers know that there's, there's plenty of layover space. Uh, in the new facility, uh, they should not be laying over in the, in the bays, especially the bay that you're you're mentioning there. So um, definitely uh, working on that that problem. Th thank you for mentioning it. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, I've seen I've seen very good um, service, and uh, I'm also want to uh, appreciate that the timetables are are back there because I think that's very important, especially for folks as they get used to the network who want a map basically, so they can kind of then visualize and, um, you know, to you can get the mobile data that shows you the, the predictions for your route is great, but also I think for people just to understand, okay, this is how it looks comprehensively within the whole city. And so I, I, I think that was a very well put together um, uh, schedule and certainly very comprehensive in explaining um, the, new, the new routes and, and visually very appealing as well. Um, I know we're uh, starting to run up against time at seven o'clock, so I'll ask if I'll open the discussion up to other members, this is our last substantive agenda item of the night. Okay, well, thanks Thanks for the update and I'm sure um, you'll be back and I, I'm very excited. I anecdotally had definitely noticed ridership seems to be ticking up. It's great to see that being confirmed in the, in the numbers. Um, so keep it up. Uh, we'll announce that our next board meeting will be Wednesday, November 2nd, 2021, 5.30 p.m. Uh, virtually. And uh, if there is no other business to come before the board, I'll ask if there's a motion to adjourn. So moved. Matt? Is there a second? Mm -hmm. Ian? All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.